Welcome back everyone. My name is Pedron and this is where we do machine learning codes and concepts. Let's get started. All right, module number six, regularization and penalized regression. In this video, I will talk about three penalized regressions, namely ridge regression, lasso and elastic net. Hopefully by the end of this video, you have a very good sense of what do these plots means and then what do we mean by regularization in general. Okay, so, so far in the course, we know what is machine learning, we know what is linear regression, we talked about it from econometrics point of view and machine learning perspective, and now it's time to talk about more advanced machine learning models. So we will start by something called penalized regression, and we will talk about parameters, hyperparameters, and how we can tune those hyperparameters using, for example, cross-validation. We're gonna do this module in two parts. In part one, I'll start by the concept of regularization and what do we mean by that. And in the next part, we're going to apply that concept of regularization to our simple linear regression model. Basically, we're going to add a penalty to the cost function and for regression models, and we're going to call them penalized regression. So let's begin with the concept of regularization and what is it that? Okay, so you have seen this plot many times, right? So for example, on the here we have error versus model complexity. And if this is a regression, you can think of it as, for example, mean squared error for regression in the cross-validation data, right? Or mean squared error in the test data. So that's that's what matters, right? And then we know that as the model becomes more complex, let me, let me actually use the right marker. Uh, so I'm here. As the model becomes more complex, the, the bias score is going to increase. So what does that mean? It means that on average, your model is going to capture the more nuances or the patterns in the data better. Yes, of course, on average, it's going to capture it better because the model is more complex, more flexible. But the problem is that as you make the model more complex, it starts basically memorizing some noise and then it becomes unnecessarily complex and flexible. It means that if you want to run the model for another realization of the data, the model variance is going to be large. So that's why as we make the model more complex, the model variance is going to increase a lot more, right? So yes, more complex model, the bias decrease, but the variance increase. But we know that at some point further, so let's say we are here, we are making the model unnecessarily complex, right? Because this means that the bias is decreasing, but the variance is increasing a lot more. And that's an issue. So the concept of regularization is basically is going to target this, this problem, right? It's going to say that, hey, let's go ahead and make the model a little bit less complex. It's okay if it is not super complex to capture everything in the data. Let's make it a little complex, a little less complex, in the hope that the variance of the model is going to decrease a lot, right? So this is actually what we're doing when we are doing regularization. Let me erase these arrows. So the idea of regularization is this. So I'm going to use red and see if I can show it to you. So it's something like this. Imagine we are here. So I'm, we are starting from here. We're going to make the model, a again, a little less complex. And by doing that, we hope that, yes, the, the downside is that the model bias is going to increase. But the model variance, look look at what, what is happening to the model variance. The model variance is going to decrease a lot. So overall, the test, you know, mean scored error in the test set or cross-validation is going to decrease. So that's the idea of regularization. So in a nutshell, let's make the model less complex in a hope that the error in the test set is going to decrease or in the cross-validation is going to decrease. So then if you apply this concept to our simple linear regression model or to, to, to the linear regression by adding some penalty, we are going to call it penalized regression. So we're going to look into the details of this concept in the following uh, slides. Regularization is a very useful concept in machine learning in general. Today we're going to mix up the idea of regularization with linear regression model and construct our penalized regression, which is used for regression analysis. Later on, we're going to mix the idea of uh, regularization with logistic regression and use it as a classifier for classification. So penalized regression is a supervised machine learning algorithm, which is parametric. It means that it is going to assume and impose a functional form for the model. Now let's dive into the details. Now let's talk about the motivation of why do we need to do regularization? Why do we ever think about it? All right. 
By now, you should be very familiar with all these graphs in this, in this screen, right? So let's start from the top left. So here, imagine the blue dots are real data. So these are the observations, right? So we call them true observations. And the red line is going to be our fit, right? So this is the fit to the data, right? So here, in this example, uh, we are going to see that the bias is going to be very high because on average, it's not capturing the true pattern in the data, which seems to be this curvature. But the variance is going to be small, right? Because it almost always captured the average, right? So if, I, if I try another sample, maybe it's this line, maybe it's this line. So always it's going to capture something like this. And on average, it is off. By off, I, I mean it doesn't capture the true pattern in the data. So in this example, the bias is going to be high and the variance is going to be very small. On the other hand, if you look at the right hand side, so here, so this, it seems that uh, the bias is going to be small. And guys, remember, bias and variance is a property of repeated sampling. So this means that if I use another sample, maybe it gets something like this. If I use another sample, maybe I get something like this, right? Yes, the variance is very large, as you can guess, but the bias is a small. Why? Because look at that. On average, let me use black. On average, is capturing the true pattern in the data, right? So we know that on the left, bias is high, variance is small. On the right, variance is high, bias is small. And so here we have underfeeding. Here we have overfeeding. So a good mix is going to be a balance between bias and variance, and we call it good balance, right? So, and it seems that this example here, so for example, if I use another line, it's this, if I use another line, it's this, and etc. if I use another sample and fit the line. So the bias is relatively small, and the variance is going to be also relatively small, right? So this is a good combination. Now, if you, if you plot all these things, in the graph below, let's let's plot error versus model complexity. And as you can see here on the top, as we go from left to right, the model is going to become more complex, right? So here the model is very simple. It's getting more complex. And here's the most complex. So as we go from left to the right, the model is going to be more complex. As we make the model more complex, I want you to pay attention to this red one. So this is our bias square. So bias square is going to decrease, right? And as we make the model more complex, the variance is going to increase as well. Guys, remember, in one of the previous lectures, we talked about decomposition of the uh, MSE. We said that MSE is a combination of bias square plus variance, model bias, model variance, plus some irreducible parts, right? We call them, let's say, IR irreducible part. Okay, so here... This is the you know, a measure of the MSE. So imagine, let's call it error rate here. If it is classification, we can call it error. If it is regression, we can look at the MSE. It's going to be exactly the same. And then if you add up these two, let's say these two numbers, we get something like this. So if at each point, you add up these two numbers. Let's say here, if you add up these two numbers, you get to this. So this curve is going to be the summation between bias square and variance. This is our total error. Right? And as you can see, total error is going to be minimized somewhere in between, somewhere here. Okay. Now, what is the idea of regularization? We're going to use regularization to penalize the, the, the complex model. Right. So let's say here we have a very complex model. We already know that the variance is large, bias is small. So let's let's penalize this. So what do I what do we mean by that? Penalize. Let's regularize it. Let's penalize it. So it means that let's make the model less complex. Let's, let's put a penalty term in the loss function that if the model is complex, it's going to cost. It's going to increase the loss, right? So the algorithm is going to automatically try to reduce that, uh, that uh, loss function, right? So the idea, what is the idea? The idea here is that imagine you're standing here. This is a level of complexity of the model we are here, right? And we hope that by regularization, by using penalized regression, we can, let's say, yes, we can increase the bias a little bit, which is not convenient, right? We don't like bias, but the hope is that, let's say, by making the model less complex, you're increasing the bias a little bit, but at the same time, you're decreasing the variance a ton, right? So the variance is going to decrease a lot, 
and the bias is going to increase a little bit minus the square and the idea is that the combination of the two is going to get reduced a lot right? so here here that's the idea where we are traveling from right so you're going from a more complex model and uh, doing some regularization if you're going to talk about the details in the future videos but this is the this is the big picture and by doing that regularization we want to get uh, we want to add a little bit of bias to the model in the hope that we can reduce the model variance a lot and in general the total error is going to reduce significantly so that's the idea of regularization all right now let's see how we can add the concept of regularization to our linear regression models right but before that we need to define some concepts here let's start with norms so what do we mean by norms in mathematics the norm of a vector is its length and it is subjective right it depends on how we define the distance between two points right for example if i have a point a here and point b depending on how we define the distance we're going to come up with different norm so this is for example one type of norm we're, we're going to give it, give it give it a name in a second another one so if i say that okay maybe the distance between a and b is a combination of the two so this is another norm or maybe we have something like this right again depending on how we measure these things these distances we come up with different norms right in regression analysis to fit our linear model we need a measure of mismatch right basically we want to see it remember in regression we have y we have y hat and this mismatch is our error rate right so let's call it e hat these are the errors and now for example one two three four we have four simple observations here we have error one error two error three error four and etc right so our vector uh, is error at each training data right so this vector that we're looking for is the error at each training data you want to measure the length of this error the length of this vector right so what are the alternatives so how can i do that so for example if i wanted to calculate the length of that error vector i can say okay simply add them up let's sum these errors right but there's a problem with this right because if we simply add them up maybe the positives and negatives are going to be cancel out each other right so here uh, y minus y hat the error is positive here y minus y hat the error is negative right so sometimes these positive negative negatives are going to cancel out each other so this is not a good candidate right simple summation is not a good candidate so what are the other what are the other options well another thing that we can think of is what we call l1 norm right and l1 norm is um, stands for least absolute error or we also call it manhattan norm so what do we mean by that basically we show it with l1 and it's a summation of absolute values right so basically it says in this example absolute value of epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 these are going to be all positive numbers right epsilon 3 and epsilon 4. so this is what we call l1 norm least absolute error or also manhattan norm and so in the example above so here is an example of manhattan norm this is another example of manhattan norm right and we are connecting these points uh, by looking at the distance uh, by, by calculating the length of that vector okay another example that we can think of is our friend l2 norm you're, you're already quite familiar with least scores this is what we use in regression analysis right and we also call it the euclidean norm and this is the formula for that we use it we show it with l2 and simply it is a summation of score uh, squared version of the errors right error squares this is exactly what we use for regression analysis for regression analysis we use l2 norm and if you want to see how it looks like in the example above so let me use another color let's say orange and imagine here we are going from a to b this is going to be our euclidean distance right because it is let's say it's a it's b it's going to be equal to a square plus b square it's a summation of square terms this is a summation of squared term this is a summation of absolute term right so we have l1 norm and l2 norm now let's see how we can apply these concepts and to help us uh, modeling the regularization or adding it to our linear regression model all right let's see how we can do that in machine learning in general there are often many features right this is one of the properties of the machine learning models usually not always right 
and those features are usually correlated with each other. This will lead to overfitting and constructing models that are unnecessarily complex, right? So this, this is most of the time the case in machine learning models, right? Again, not always, but most of the time you're dealing with many features and the models are unnecessarily complex. Regularization is going to force the learning algorithm to build a less complex model. So this, this is a key. You're using regularization to make a less complex model. And in practice, that often leads to slightly higher bias, but significantly lower variance. So remember, I said it earlier, the idea of regularization is that let's add a little bit of bias intentionally. So I'm going to add this one intentionally in the hope that we can reduce the variance a lot. And this will reduce our MSE in general. And this, this uh, happens for both classification and regression. So this is an example for regression, right? All right, and look at this example in this graph. So it seems that uh, we have a non-regularized model, the blue curve, and the regularized version, the green one. So the way that the model does that, let's say this blue one has some, co imagine this is polynomial regression with very high degrees of polynomial. We have, I don't know, we have W1x plus W2x2 plus, let's say, W15x15. So this model is unnecessarily complex, right? And as you can see, it is capturing noises instead of capturing the true pattern, right? So we're going to apply regularization, and that regularization is going to force the coefficient of, let's say, these features to be equal to zero or send them to zero. We're going to talk about the difference. And let's say, keep the model something like this, W3x3. So this is our green model. This is a regularized version. It's going to make the model less complex by adding a little bit of bias and reducing the variance a lot. Okay. So we talked about the two most widely used uh, regularizations, uh, which, which are L1 and L2 norm. And now the idea that we can add them to the model is quite simple. To create a regularized model, we modify the loss function by adding the penalty term. So we also call it shrinkage term shrinkage term, which value is higher when the model is more complex. So basically, let's look at the loss function. So this is how we are adding the, the idea of regularization to our linear regression model. For now, I just I want you to ignore this penalty term. There is no penalty term here. There is no penalty term here, right? What do you see? This is our simple optimization for linear regression model, right? We are minimizing the mean squared error over the weights and the bias term. And basically, this is minimizing y minus y hat. So in machine learning, let's show it with f of w and b. This is basically our y hat that the machine is trying to learn. And squared that. So this is mean squared error, right? Now, let's go back and see how we can add the, penal, uh, the regularization term. We're going to add a penalty term to, that, to this loss function, right? So this is our penalty term. And as you can see, the penalty is a function of weights, the, the loadings of the features, right? And the idea is that you add this penalty, and when you add that penalty, this MSE, look at that, guys, remember here, up in, up in the screen, why we did regularization, in the hope that we can reduce the MSE, right? So you add the penalty term here, down here, in order to hope that this MSE is going to reduce, to get smaller and smaller, right? And then... So this is, there's going to be a trade-off because if you add more features to the model, you're going to have, let's say, you're going to have more Xs. If you have more Xs, you're going to have more Ws. So the penalty term is going to increase. If the penalty term is going to increase, then the MSE is going to decrease, right? But this is not always the case. At some point, the penalty is going to increase a lot more and the algorithm is going to stop there, right? Because it's not worth doing that. You know, the amount of bias that you're adding to the model is going to dominate the amount of reduction in the variance. So for that reason, the model is going to figure out what's the trade-off between these two, right? Between adding a pen penalty term and between the redu and reduction, uh, having a reduction in MSC. Right? So this is the idea of how we can add the, the, the concepts of regularization to our linear regression model. So regularization plus multiple linear regression model is going to give us penalized regression. So this is a loss function, as we talked about it earlier, the MSE plus some penalty term, right? 
And the idea is simple. In a penalized regression, a feature that you're adding must make a sufficient contribution to model fit to offset the penalty from including it, right? Remember, as I add a feature, the penalty is going to increase. Then, therefore, only the more important features for explaining why will remain in the penalized regression model. So by doing that, the penalized regression is going to be able to reduce a large number of features to a manageable set. Let's say we can go from thousands of features to tens of features. And uh, it's, it's going to be useful for making a prediction, especially when features are highly correlated, right? And so penalized regularization, the can, sorry, penalized regression can be used to avoid overfitting as well, because as, as we saw that this plot, so here's is my bias score, here's the variance, we're adding a little bit of bias in a hope that we can reduce the variance a lot. So here the model was overfitting. You want to get to the realm of, let's say, good fit, right? Good fit. All right. However, just remember, guys, that let me erase this part. OK, to use a penalized regression, we need to first standardize the features. So if you don't know what we mean by standardizing the features, in one of the previous parts, we talked about standardizing the features and how, why, we use, how, why we should scale the features and what are the advantages. So this, in, for penalized regression, this will allow us to compare the magnitude of regression coefficients for the feature variables, right? But just in short, imagine you have a regression model. Let's say this model out up here. Wage is a function of, let's use thetas plus, uh, no, let's use weights, let's use machine learning. So this is our bias term plus W1. Imagine we have, let's say, education, which is reported in years, plus W2, you know, working hours, which is reported in minutes for whatever reason, okay? Just for the sake of argument, let's say that's, that's the case, right? And wage is annual salary and if you go ahead and calculate the weights maybe this weight is going to be in a scale of you know ten thousands for each additional unit of education maybe the weight is going to increase or decrease by by thousands of dollars so this is in a scale of ten thousand and this is imagine if you're reporting in the data the working hours are reported as minutes so this is going to and for annual wage it's going to be tiny right so let's say about cents as you can see, the weights here are in scale of 10,000 versus 1%. And then when you're using the, those uh, norms, L1 norm, L2 norm, and you want to add that, for example, if, if you use L2 norm, you're going to add these things, right? Summation of WIs to the power, let's say WJs to the power of 2. And it is not a fair comparison to, if you want to penalize these weights later on, it's not fair to look at weight one, which is in a scale of 10K, and versus weight two, which is in a scale of 1%, right? So for that reason, we need to standardize the features. We need to scale the features. Okay, so what are, what are the differences between different penalized regression models? The only difference is the penalty term, right? Remember guys, here we had a penalty term. Now, depending on how do you, uh, what functional form you use for that penalty term, you come up with different models, right? So in short, if you use L2 norm, oops, sorry. If you use L2 norm, let me use blue. If you use L2, we are gonna call it ridge regression. If you use L1, it is going to be lasso regression. And if you use a combination of L1 and L2, it is called elastic net re regression, right? So at the end of the day, if you are penalizing, if, if the penalty term is something like this, the summation of absolute value of weight, so this is going to give us uh, the lasso because it's L1. If it's a summation of WJ to the power of two, this is going to be our ridge regression. And for a combination of the two that later on, it's going to be a weighted uh, average of the two. So the average, weighted average. So some sort of weighted average. Weighted average is going to be our elastic net. Okay, now that we know the difference between ridge, lasso, and elastic net regression at high level, let's talk about the details, starting with the ridge regression. So what is ridge regression? 
Here's the loss function. We are minimizing MSE plus some penalty term, and that penalty is a function of weight, right? And depending on how we define that functional form for the penalty term, we come up with different penalized regression. In rich regression, that penalty, that functional form is L2 norm. So if you use L2 norm for the functional form of penalty, basically the summation of weight squares, then this is called rich regression. And our lambda is our shrinkage parameter. So let, let's, let's talk about it in more details. So the shrinkage penalty, the shrinkage parameter, has the effect of shrinking the estimates of W towards zero. It doesn't make them exactly zero. It's going to force them towards zero. Uh, so how does that work? The idea is that if we, uh, let's say there's this lambda, this is our hyperparameter in the model, right? If lambda increase, then the penalty term is going to increase, right? So this right-hand side is going to increase. If the penalty term increases, the algorithm is going to reduce the weights of those features that are less contributing to the model fit, right? So at the end of the day, as you increase the lambda, the algorithm is going to force a bunch of those Ws, let's say Wj's, towards zero. It doesn't make them exactly zero. We're going to talk about the details of this, why, it cannot, why the ridge regression cannot make the weights exactly equal to zero, but it will send them, it will shrink them, send them towards zero. Uh, later on, we're going to discuss why, why it cannot exactly set them to zero. Okay, so the tuning parameter lambda, it serves to control the relative impact of the penalty term on the regression coefficient estimate, right? As I said, if lambda increase, these weights are going to send to towards zero, and those features will be selected that are less contributing to the model fit. This is the mechanism of how lambda is doing the job. All right, selecting a good uh, value for lambda, our hyperparameter, is very critical. And we're going to use cross-validation to the, optimize the parameter for lambda. Remember, guys, this lambda is a hyperparameter. It means that it is set, it is, it is pre-specified in the train set, right? So, um, I mean, we're going to use, we're going to fix a lambda. And then the, along with the model parameters, we're going to use a train set and train the model. And after that, we're going to use cross-validation to go back and optimize the value of lambda itself. All right. And uh, for all the regularization models uh, and penalized regressions, uh, ridge regression is the same. It is best to apply ridge regression after variable standardization because we want to make sure that these Ws that we are uh, adding them to the loss function are relatively comparable, W1, W2, W3, and etc. right? We talked about this motivation in the previous lecture as well. All right, now let's look at an example. So imagine this is a true relationship in the data, right? This one. Y is equal to X plus 2X squared minus 3X cubed. And guys, remember, this true relationship in the real world is not observable. But here, we are going to work with the simulated data and see how to penalize regression, specifically the ridge regression, is able to give us back the right coefficients, right? So the right coefficient for, let's say, x, which is w1. Let me write it down. So this is our w1, w2, and w3, which is minus 3, right? So in real world, this is the true relationship is unobserved, and we are trying to estimate and get as close as possible to that true relationship. So imagine we are going to impose a functional form, right, to the model. Let's say I'm going to estimate this true relationship by this regression model. I'm going to use the polynomial model, and we have a bias term plus the coefficients, the features, and at most to the power of 5. So the polynomial degree to the power of 5. So imagine this is our model. So we have five weights to estimate, W1, W2, W3, W4, and W5. And again, just uh, as a reminder, remember, we know that the answer should be these two should be exactly equal to zero or close to zero, and one, W1 should be one, W2 should be two, W3 should be minus three. Let's see if the ridge regression is able to get close to these weights or not, right? So here's a plot of ridge regression coefficients, basically the Ws, 
versus alpha. So in Python, so this is what I did in Python. In Python, this alpha is our lambda. So we call our shrinkage parameter, uh, the penalty term alpha in Python, but this is the same as uh, lambda. And by the way, if you're curious to look at the codes uh, uh, or, or the, the full lectures, please make sure that you watch my, uh, the, you know, my other the course uh, over YouTube namely the machine learning applications in finance, where I share all the slides and my the Jupyter notebooks on my GitHub account. Okay, so here's what we have. And imagine the, let me call it Lambda. Let's say Lambda here is close to one, close to zero. So it's 1%, let's say cl relatively close to zero. If Lambda is zero, what do we get? I want you to go back to the loss function and think about it intu intuitively. If lambda is equal to zero, so it means that we are not penalizing the coefficients at all. So what do we get? We get W1 through W5 for the multiple linear regression model, right? So here, this is my x1, this is x2, so x to the power of 2, x to the power of 3, and x to the power of 5. And so this means that the blue one, this is W1, then the orange one is our W2. Then the green one is our W3. The red one is our W4. And the purple one is our W5. So if lambda is equal to zero or close to zero, basically these are our initial weights that we get from multiple linear regression model. Then as we increase lambda, as we go to the right, let's say 1%, 0.1, 1, 10, 100, and 1,000, and etc. As we go to the right, we are increasing that penalty term. So what will happen? The algorithm is going, because that penalty term is added to the, the cost function, the algorithm is going to make sure that it minimizes the coefficients of the features that are less contributing to the model fit, right? The features that are less important. So it's going to get rid of those features uh, faster as we increase the lambda. So let's look at that. So here, let's say, let me give you an extreme case first. So let's say lambda is equal to, we are going to send lambda to infinity. It's very large. If lambda is very large, so let's say we are here. So what is this? As you can see, all the coefficients wj are equal to zero, right? These are the coefficients that are equal to zero. So what does that mean? That means that your y hat is going to be a simple average, right? So basically, lambda was too large, and the algorithm decided that it's not worth to uh, to keep any feature in the model. So let's let's drop them all by sending all the weights to the zero toward zero. Okay. Now let's say the, by doing cross validation, we're going to, to find the optimal lambda. Let's say it's somewhere around here, right? I'm just speculating. We we see the exact number uh, for lambda in the Python code available on my GitHub account. Let's say this is the optimal level of lambda. We call it lambda optimal. Okay. And at that lambda, and as you can see, so here is our W3, which is negative. This is our W5 and W4, W4 and W5. They're, they're very close to zero, let's say. Then we have a positive W2 and a positive W1. So this is getting closer and closer to these one, numbers, right? So W3 is a negative one, W1 and two are positive, and W4 and five are being sent towards zero. Not exactly zero, but are being sent towards zero. So as you can see, the ridge regression is doing a relatively decent job by penalizing this model to get as close as possible to the true relationship in the data, which is that model, okay? Now, let's talk about what's behind the scene. Why the coefficients in ridge regression model are sent towards zero and why they cannot be exactly set equal to zero. So why we cannot use ridge regression for feature selection in other terms. So this means that if you have 1000 features in the model, model uh, in the data, then if you use ridge regression, you're going to still have 1000 features. So you're not going to say that I can use ridge regression for feature selection or for reducing uh, the dimension of the data, right? So let, let's see what's behind the scene. Uh, remember, our loss function was something like this. So we were minimizing the MSE 
plus some penalty term and that penalty was a function of w right so here because we were using l2 norm it was equal to summation of the weights to the power of two right now we're going to write a dual version of this convex optimization problem so this is our convex optimization problem and the dual version is something like this so this is what you can find in the the uh, the ISLR textbook as well, the main textbook that we are, I'm using as a reference, Introduction to Statistical Learning. So this is a dual version of the same optimization function. And it come back, uh, this is, uh, look at that, we can write it like this. Instead, we can, we can say, okay, let's minimize the first part. So this is the first part, right? subject to the second part so this is a subject to, to the second part and the terminology in that textbook instead of weights w's uh, they are using betas but the idea is basically the same so this is the same as looking at your weight score should be less than or equal to some number okay let's say number s and the first part is basically our uh, the y minus y hat square this is our mean squared error okay now this is a convex optimization problem we are minimizing a convex function look at that this is a convex function it's a very well behaved convex function we are minimizing that subject to a convex set right well well look at that just ignore this the the subject to part for a second and here let's focus on minimizing this mse this is our simple optimization problem, right? So at the end of the day, depending on different values of beta, let's say we are, we are in two dimension, only beta one, beta two, and for, di for different values of beta, we can plot counters that will give us exactly the same, the MSE, right? So for example, here is one MSE, here's another MSE, and et cetera. And here's another MSE, okay? So let's, and then you're going to minimize that at some point. So for this value of beta one and beta two, let's call them beta hat one, beta hat two, the MSE is minimized. So this is a minimized MSE. MSE or any other kind of loss function, right? So you can think of RSS, MSE, and et cetera. The idea is the same, okay? However, we're adding this restriction now. And what is that restriction? The restriction is that the summation of weights squared, in this case, beta one, beta hat one squared plus beta hat two squared should be less than equal to some number. So let's say that number is S or delta, so, right? So this is going to be the radius. Then now with this, uh, uh, this uh, restriction, we have to look at the intersect between the two, right? So what's the intersect between this constraint and the, the the contours right so the answer in this example sh let me use another color let's say blue is this the tangent point the tangent between the restriction and the optimized function right the convex function so and as you can see maybe the answer to this example is this is our beta hat one this is our beta hat two and if you notice this beta hat one and beta hat two namely in machine learning language w1 and w2 can go to zero, but they're never exactly equal to zero because this counter cannot hit any of these exact points, these ones, right? So for that reason, in rich regression, we can send the coefficients to zero. The model can send the coefficient to zero, but it cannot, it can never make it exactly equal to zero, right? So for that reason, we cannot use it for feature selection. So let's look at that in this example. It seems that W, uh, w2 dude yeah w yeah w1 which is our beta hat one is sent towards zero the beta hat one is a small and w2 uh, or our beta hat two is a larger number it's a it's a positive number whatever alpha all right so that was the behind the scene of how the ridge regression model is able to send the coefficient towards zero but uh, not exactly equal to zero Next, let's talk about lasso regression. So what is lasso regression? So lasso stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. So it's also a shrinkage method like ridge regression. 
but on top of that it is used for feature selection so that's why we say and selection operator so let's always use for feature selection as well so the loss function is very similar to penalize regression in general and the only difference between lasso and bridge regression is the functional form for the penalty term so as you can see instead of l2 norm what are we using you're using l1 norm right so l1 norm least absolute so lasso regression is using l1 norm and it's with by using l1 later on in the very final slide we're going to see exactly why but by using L1, it is able to eliminate. So this is a difference between lasso and, uh, sorry, here, eliminate, between lasso and ridge regression. Lasso eliminates the least important feature from the model, and it automatically performs the type of feature selection. So this is a big advantage of lasso versus ridge regression, because not only it's going to shrink some parameters, shrink, shrink some coefficients, but also it will force them to be exactly equal to zero. So let's say you have 10,000 features and depending on what value you're gonna pick for this penalty term, you will end up, let's say instead of 10,000, you will end up with 10, 15, 20. You know, that, that's, uh, that's something that you can adjust, right? So we, we use lasso, reg lasso regression for the feature selection as well. And like the ridge regression model in lasso, selecting a good value of lambda is critical because remember lambda, is our hyperparameter right so this is our hyperparameter sorry this is our hyperparameter and we're going to optimize that hyperparameter by using cross validation down the road okay uh, like any other penalized regression models uh, we need to standardize the features before uh, training the model why because remember the penalty term here is something like the summation of absolute values of weights and it is important for us to compare you know, these weights that we are adding are comparable to each other, right? It's going to help uh, the algorithm a lot to find the, the uh, to be, f firstly, to be faster and smoother. Okay, now let me tell you a couple of comments about Lasso. And so this is also a parametric model, right? Because we are imposing a functional form. And as you can see, this is a functional form that we're imposing to the f of x. This is our linear regression function, let's say. And on top of that, let's look at the loss function. So this is our loss function. So one of the caveats with lasso is that the loss function is not very well behaved, right? We are going to have a bunch of edges in the loss function. So maybe we, we end up with corner solution, okay? And so because the loss function is well behaved, we cannot uh, simply use, there is no close form solution for this optimization problem. And we have to use gradient descent and its family to find the optimal parameters for Ws, okay? So that, this is one of the caveats of Lasso compared to ridge regression. Okay. Now let's take a look at our uh, example that we covered in the previous uh, episode as well, where the true relationship was observed, right? So this is a hypothetical example. Imagine you know what is the true relationship in the data, right? True relationship be uh, between X and Y. And as I said earlier, this is not observable in real world. However, let's say we know that, right? So this is our W1, W2, and W3. Okay. And now we're going to use the, the lasso regression to figure out if we can get close to these Ws, the true parameters in the model or not, right? So let's impose a functional form as the previous time. So we're imposing this polynomial degree to the power of 5. I can add a noise as well here, okay, because these are the estimated numbers. And, uh, and let's see at the end of the day if Lasso is able to force W4 and W5 to be exactly equal to zero and then figure out some numbers for W1, 2, and 3. So this should be negative. These are positive, right? Okay. So let's plot Lasso regression coefficients versus alpha. So this is exactly the same exercise that we did for ridge regression. So here, again, this is Python. And... This is our lambda. In Python, we call it alpha. And for those of you who are curious to look at the code um, yourself, make sure that you watch my the machine learning 
a machine learning course and its application in finance on YouTube, right? So there you can find all the slides and the Jupyter notebooks on my GitHub account. Okay, so what do we have? Here, the blue one is our W1, the orange one, W2, the red one, W3, sorry, the red one is W4, and we have green one, which is W3, and the purple one is W5. All right, now the same exercise. If lambda is small, if lambda is equal to zero, these are going to be our initial uh, coefficients out of the linear regression model, right? Because there is no penalty term. If there is no penalty term, we get back our simple weights when we use linear regression model. If the lambda is super large, so let's say if lambda is large, then the model is going to penalize everything and all the features in the model and it will end up with all the weights to be equal to zero. So what is a good combination? Uh, you know, Python has some built-in functions for doing cross-validation and calculating the optimal level of lambda. And let's say, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's somewhere around here. Maybe lambda is somewhere around here. So this is lambda optimal. In that case, so in lambda optimal, what is W4? Do you see a red color here? No, so it's zero. What is W5? Do you see a purple one here? No, it's zero. And this is our W3, which is a negative number. And these are our W2 and W1. So this is W2, W1. So it seems that Lasso is doing a better job compared to ridge regression because it is specifically forced W4 and W5 to be equal to zero. And we know that in real, in the true relationship in the data, W4 and W5 were equal to zero. All right. Now, let's, uh, let's look at the visualization of oh, sorry, the ridge and Lasso versus Lambda. So this is the case both for ridge regression and Lasso. As lambda increase, when we go from left to right, as lambda increase, the model becomes less complex or simpler. And the true, the green dots are the true observations. And these are, let me actually, I can use maybe two colors. Let's say this is the green, the, the blue one is for less. So I'm going to use red for rich, right? So if, if lambda is a small, if lambda is a small, both Lasso and Ridge are going to uh, you know, come up with a more, let's say, very flexible model like this, and maybe they overlap, right? Because we are not uh, penalizing anything. Okay. The reason that I say maybe they overlap because in the next video I'm going to talk about the differences. The path to the optimal weights is, is kind of different for Ridge versus Lasso. Okay. Then here, if lambda is large. For lasso, we know that all the coefficients are going to be exactly equal to zero, right? Exactly equal to zero for lasso. But for ridge, again, if lambda is super large, yes, they are going to be close to zero, but not exactly equal to zero. So may, maybe there is there is a little uh, slope here and there. Maybe there's a little curvature here and there, but it really doesn't matter. You know, eventually it's going to be exactly well. Eventually the, the coefficients are very close to zero, right? And then in between here we have lambda is let's say optimal. By optimal we mean that we get the best combination of bias versus variance trade-off, right? And let's say for both of them, I think it's something like that. May, maybe again for for rich there is a little curvature remaining in the model. So this is for rich because all, not all the coefficients are exactly equal to zero, but for less so, we're going to have, let's say the model will end, will end up with something like this, less so. Okay, so here, so let me give you a functional form. Maybe we're doing something like this. Uh, B plus W1X plus W2X squared plus W3X, oops, sorry, W3X cubed, and etc. So here in this example, both W2 and W3 are equal to zero. Uh, yeah, zero. And W1 is not equal to zero. This is for lasso. However, for ridge, we're going to end up with a very small, maybe tiny number for W2 and W3. So that's why there's going to be a little bit of curvature left. A little bit of curvature. Maybe maybe we cannot even see it with eyes. Okay. 
Okay, I thought we, it would be helpful to basically show you what is the relationship between the cost function and the lambda in our penalized regression. Because after all, we are adding this penalty term to the cost function, which was the MSE, in our regression. And you'll see what is the relationship between lambda. So here on the vertical axis, I have JWB. Simply, this is a cost function, which is a function of parameters. And uh, basically, we have a hyperparameter lambda as well, and versus lambda, right? So let's see how it goes. I'm going to start with the train set. Let's let's say we're interested in the cost function in the train set. So basically, we're going to calculate this cost in with using the train observations, right? For x and y's, we're going to use you know x and y's. We're going to use basically a train train set. So let's say, and you know that, let's say here is lambda is equal to zero. Lambda is a very large number. I don't know, let's say infinity, super large number, right? If the lambda is zero, so you know that by now, you pretty much know that the model is more complex or less complex. Yeah, more complex. So it means that if we go from right to left, the model is more complex. The extreme case is that lambda is equal to zero. So this means that there's no restriction, restrictions on the weight. And if we started with the very super flexible models, there's no restrictions on the weights. It's going to be, uh, the functional form is going to be flexible as well. And if lambda is infinity, again, we're going to basically crush this cost function by the heavy weight of uh, lambda and then say, you know what, all the Ws should be zero or sent towards zero. Okay, so let's start with the train set. In the train set, if lambda is equal to zero, and imagine we have something like this, you know, again, very simplistically, y, x, and we have this strange relationship in the data. And then because lambda is zero, maybe the model is complex and it's capturing everything, right? So obviously the, the J train, you know, basically the cost in the train set is going to be super small or even close to zero, right? As we make the model less complex, so it means that as we go, you know, for example, here on from left to right, let's say I'm making the model less complex, right? So we go, of course, the cost is going to increase. And obviously, if I make the model not complex at all, so this is going to be the model. So obviously, the cost in the train is going to be also large. So as we know, so as lambda is increasing, the cost function in the train set is also increasing, right? But do we care about the train set only? No, because if I was only interested in the train set, what was the optimal answer all the time? Lambda is equal to zero. Get the most flexible, most complex model and work with that and that's it. That's gonna decrease the cost uh, in the train set all to almost zero, right? But we don't care about train set because we know that a good model is a model that can generalize well on something that it has not seen before, namely test set. In practice, for tuning the lambda hyperparameter, we're gonna look at cross-validation. So I'm gonna use, let's say use black, and then visualize the same stuff for J cross-validation, right? JCV, okay? So if the, and then there we know that there's going to be a balance between the complexity of the model and basically the, the value of lambda, right? And then, so we're going to say, let me actually see if I can do another visualization. Let's start from here. The lambda is equal to a very small number, right? Lambda is equal to zero. Again, this is our, this is our data. And we know that if the model is super complex, it's going to be something like this. But what if sometimes in the train, in the cross validation, the, the, the data that we're picking from the data are something like this. And then we know that the distance is going to be large, so the mean squared error is going to be large. So that's why if we make the model super simple, then in the train set, we're going to start from here. Let me actually use, let's say here, so J cross-validation, sorry, in the cross-validation. The, the cost in the cross-validation is going to be large. And then obviously, if you make the model simpler, so this cost is going to decrease, but at some point, it's going to start increasing again because even for cross violation, if the model is super, super, super duper simple, if I get something like this, again, regardless if I'm using a train set or cross violation or test set, this is going to be large. Okay. So, and this, we have seen this before. Let me actually use a highlighter. We have seen this before. So what is the optimal lambda? The optimal lambda, lambda is going to be somewhere around here. So let me use a right color. 
this is going to be optimal level of complexity that we're going to figure it out with cross validation. All right, I thought that that should be helpful uh, because we're going to see this in Python in our next uh, in our next video. And now here's a question of the day for Ridge versus Lasso. So I want you to pay attention and maybe pause the video for a second and think about it that if this, let's say, A versus B, tell me which one is less, so using lasso, which one is using ridge regression by looking at the path of the coefficients, right? So the one A on the left, look at that, the path of the coefficient, the path of weights is very smooth and they were, they're converging to zero. So this is ridge. The path is on a smooth. We're going to talk about this on a smooth path later on. And uh, maybe sometimes it even, uh, look at that, the weights increase, negative number, and then go up again, right? So some of them are exactly set to equal to zero in between. So this is our last. So, all right. Now, finally, let's see what is behind the scene when you're using lasso regression, okay? Uh, so we had this uh, we had this argument in the previous episode as well that why lasso is able to exactly set some of the coefficients equal to zero, right? So let's write the minimization problem. We are minimizing the loss functions, and loss function is a combination of MSE plus some penalty term, right? And this can be MSE or RSS. If you see in this example, this is RSS, residual sum of square. So this is y minus y hat. To the power of two, so basically this is RSS, but that's basically the same idea. You know, if you minimize the RSS, it's as if you're minimizing the MSC, right? It doesn't make any changes to what are the optimal values. Okay, so here is a dual version of that convex optimization problem. We're going to say that minimize the convex function over this convex set, right? And uh, so here. In machine learning terminology, we use weights. So we have the weights less than or equal to S. And this is our, let's say, RSS. So again, uh, the same discussion as we had, that we had before. So for now, let's ignore this one, the subject two part, and try to minimize this RSS. So we have, so for example, here is RSS1, RSS2. Each contour was going to the, the points on each contour, the combination of beta 1, beta 2 on each contour is going to give you the same value for RSS, so to, right? And without any restrictions, we know that there is a global solution for beta hat 1, beta hat 2, right? So this is your beta hat 1, beta hat 2. And here you get your minimum RSS. In the previous video, it's, I talked about minimum MSE. That's basically the same idea. Okay. Now let's add back this restriction. So how can I visualize this restriction? If I have only two parameters, so square root of W1 plus square root of W2 is less than or equal to some number, right? So this is as if you're looking at, you know, X, Y axis, Y plus X is less than or equal to some number. So this is, how does it look? It's something like this, right? So the same story we have here we have beta 1 beta 2 and etc okay so now we're looking at the intersection between the two right so what is the intersection between this convex set and this minimization so on the answer and as you can see it can happen that the intersection is exactly at some corners right so here beta 1 which is our w1 is exactly equal to 0 and our beta 2 or our w2 is not equal to zero right so that's why lasso can make sure that some of the coefficients are exactly equal to zero not only sending them not only shrinking them but also is going to make sure that they are exactly equal to zero and for that reason lasso is going to be used for feature selection as well so this is one of the advantages of lasso versus rich but of course there are some disadvantages that we're going to discuss in the next video Okay, next part, elastic net regression. So this is going to be the last penalized regression that we're going to cover in this video. Now, what is elastic net? As I said earlier, it's a combination of the rich regression and lasso regression. And here is the loss function. It's a summation of MSC plus a penalty term. And that penalty is a linear function, is a linear combination between this one, what is this? We are using L1 norm, so this is lasso. This one, we're using L2 norm, this is 
our ridge. And we're going to give, give the weights based on the two hyperparameters, lambda 1, lambda 2. Okay. All right. So in Lasso, some weights are reduced to zero, right? But other may be quite large. In ridge, weights are small in magnitude, but they're not reduced to zero, right? So this is the summary of Lasso and, and ridge, right? In Lasso, we send the weights, we set some of them, some of them exactly equal to zero, right? For some of them. And for the other ones that are remaining in the model, they may be large. So this is Lasso. For ridge, no, we send to, we reduce the features, you know, we shrink the features, the coefficient of the features, maybe send them towards zero. So they are not, not all of them are large, but at the same time, not many of them are zero, right? Now let's say, can we combine these two ideas? Can we get the best of these, best of two worlds? And the answer is yes, we can do elastic net, right? So elastic net, we may be able to get the best of the two worlds, right? By making some weights zero, so basically it's forced the sum of those w's to be exactly equal to zero, while reducing the magnitude of the others as well. So this is what we can do with re with ridge regression. So a combination of the two. Okay. Now let's compare ridge versus lasso versus elastic net. So this slide is going to be a very important one, and hopefully is going to answer the question that many of you guys have that when can I use ridge why should we always not use elastic net if it is the best of the two right why do we want to use less so so in order to answer all those questions let's review this slide very carefully all right now let's review some questions and based on the answers to those questions we will end up using either ridge lasso or elastic net so what I want you to do is that pause the video uh, and try to answer all these questions on your own. Okay, so now let's do it together. First one, this model can shrink the coefficients uh, towards zero. It can shrink it towards zero. So ridge, yes, lasso, yes, and elastic net, yes, right? So that's the answer. Okay, next one. This model can include all the features in the model, even with large lambda. So if lambda is large, we know that the, pen, the, the penalty term is going to be, if the penalty term is large, then the algorithm is going to get rid of those features that are less useful, right? So here the question is that this model can include all the features in the model, even with large lambda. So in another, in another term, it's not going to send them to, set them exactly equal to zero. So, yes, no, and no. Do you agree? There you go. Okay. Now, the next question, this is a really important one. This model can force some of the coefficient estimate to be exactly equal to zero. And for that reason, it can be used for feature selection, right? So this is this is a really interesting property of the model, right? Or, or sparse output, or more explainable. So what do we mean by that? By sparse output, we mean that the model is less complex, right? It's simpler. And so if it is simpler, it is going to be more explainable as well. So what do you think? Can we do it with ridge? No. How about less so? Yes. How about elastic net? Yes. All right. Next one. Is it robust? And by robust, we mean is it uh, resistant to outliers or not, right? We're, I'm going to discuss this, uh, let's say, this one and this one together. What do we mean by robust and if there is any analytical solution or requires gradient descent or not? So, so, so let's, let's focus on these two questions together. For the robust part, is it sensitive to outliers? Remember, in reach, we are using L2. An L2 norm in general is sensitive to outliers, right? When you're adding uh, the squared version of the coefficients together. So it is going to be sensitive, right? So is it robust? No. For lasso, we're using L1 norm, so it is less sensitive to outliers. And for elastic net, it's somewhere in between, so we can call not very, right? All right, and now, is there any analytical solution And for that? If there's any analytical solution, then we don't need to do gradient descent because there's a closed form solution. If there is no closed form solution, we have to use gradient descent to, to optimize the parameters in the model, right? So, and the question is, uh, no analytical analytical solution. So for ridge regression, 
Remember, the loss function was very well behaved, right? In ridge regression, we were minimizing the MSE plus L2. So this is a well behaved one. So there is an anal analytical solution. We don't need to have it. We don't need to use gradient descent for finding the optimal values for parameters. But what about lasso and elastic net? Well, unfortunately, we need to use gradient descent because the, fun the, the loss function is not well behaved. Okay, so this is maybe one of the advantages of reach over uh, lasso and elastic net. Basically, the idea is that the path uh, to the optimal coefficient, to the optimal weight, is smoother in reach versus lasso and elastic net. And then finally, let's talk about if there is always a unique solution or not. So for that, what do we mean? Let me let me show you an example. So remember, in lasso, in reach, we are using L2 norm. And L2, there's a unique solution. If I go, want to go from A to B, there's a unique solution for that. Okay. And for that reason, in rich regression, there's a unique solution. However, for lasso, we can have solution number one. This is L1, solution number two, solution number three. This is our Manhattan distance, right? I can go some, like this, from A to B, like this. So this is another solution, right? Let's say solution number four. So for that reason, there is no unique solution for lasso. And you, you, you might want to think that, okay, elastic net is a combination of ridge and lasso. So why there is a unique solution for elastic net? Well, the discussion is beyond the, uh, the scope of this conceptual machine learning course that I'm covering. But there's a paper written in the, around 2005, I believe, that it mathematically proved that there is a unique solution for elastic net optimization problem. All right, I think, I hope that with this comparison, now you have a better understanding that why you should use ridge regression, for example, over lasso or an elastic, and why do you want, to, you want to use elastic net over ridge or lasso. Okay, now finally, let's look at the behind the scene of elastic net as well. So in the previous videos, we covered that this is our ridge optimization, you know, convex optimization problem. This is the lasso convex optimization problem, and finally, this is our elastic net. And as you can see, in lasso and elastic net, the model is able to set the features, the coefficient of the feature exactly equal to be zero. So we use them, we use lasso and elastic net for uh, feature selection. So here in this example, imagine we are using, uh, showing the parameters with theta. So what do we have here? Theta 1 is equal to 0, theta 2 is a positive number. Here, same story. Theta 1 is equal to 0, theta 2 is a positive number. But here, theta 1, sorry, not w, theta 1 and 0, theta 1 and theta 2 may go towards 0, but they're never exactly equal to 0. All right, so L1 norm, L2 norm, and a combination of the two. I hope that this visualization helps you to realize that why elastic net and lasso are able are used for feature selection uh, and why the ridge regression cannot, you know, con construct by construction cannot be used for feature selection. Okay, this wrap up our module number six, penalized regression. So once we're done with the Python part, we're going to look into our first classification model, which is logistic regression. Yeah, the name says regression, but we're going to use it for classification. So we're going to talk about it, what's going on there. And then this is basically our one of the most simplest yet most powerful uh, classification models that we're going to cover in the class, logistic regression. Until the next one, take care.